for Senator Day O'Connor had no discernible opposition, close quote. But it was blocked since way last year. And today I ask consent that a copy of Ms. Collins' column be placed in the record at the conclusion of my remarks. The, uh, I don't know how you explain to the American people this kind of obstruction. Uh, this Republican filibuster, this Cuban American, like that Judge Jordan, is very hard to understand, especially when he had the support of both the senators from his home state, one a Democrat, one a Republican. Now, in this case, we have Jesse Furman, an experienced federal prosecutor, who has prosecuted international narcotics trafficking and terrorism. He's consulted in some of the Southern District's most complex cases, including the Galleon in insider trading case, the prosecution of former Madoff employees, and the Tom Times Square bomber case. A dedicated public servant, Mr. Form Furman, has been a law clerk at all three levels of the federal judiciary, including as a clerk to Supreme Court Justice David Souter. Now, I got to know Mr. Furman when he was counselor to Attorney General Michael Mukasey. That's right, the Senate Republicans are filibustering somebody strongly supported by President Bush's Attorney General, who was himself a federal judge. In fact, with Mr. Furman's nomination for the committee way last year, Attorney General McCasey wrote to the committee in strong support. Former Supreme Court clerks who served at the same time as Mr. Furman, including clerks for conservative justices, such as Chief Justice Rehnquist, Justice Thomas, and Justice Scalia, wrote in support of Mr. Furman's nomination, stating that Mr. Furman has demonstrated his deep respect for and commitment to the rule of law over and above politics or ideology. Now, with his bipartisan support, the strong support of his home state senators, his impressive background, Mr. Furman's nomination was reported by the Judiciary Committee last year, September, without opposition from a single member, Republican or Democratic, of the committee. Now, we should have voted on this nomination months ago, but instead he's been blocked by Senate Republicans for over five months with no explanation. Of course, this is not the first New York judge we filibustered by Senate Republicans. Just a few years ago, Judge Denny Chin, an outstanding nominee with 16 years judicial experience was delayed from being elevated to the Second Circuit for four months till we forced a vote. Incidentally, you think being delayed all that time, that he, there'd be a lot of opposition. I would note that the vote on him was 98 to zero. Just like culture on Judge Jack McConnell, in other words. You know, McConnell, we turned away from a precipice. It's wrong now for us to approach that precipice again. Phil Buster, in this nomination, would set a new standard for obstruction of judicial nominations. We ought to be working for the American people, putting their needs first. So, Mr. President, I urge him to stop this five month delay. I'd ask uh, consent to put my full statement in the record. No objection, so ordered. And Mr. President, I see the uh, Deputy Republican Leader on the floor. I simply say I have, you just hold for a moment, I have 10 unanimous consent requests for committees to meet today during uh, today's session of the Senate. They have the approval of the majority and minority leaders. I ask unanimous consent these requests be agreed to and the request be put in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Morning business is closed under the previous order. The Senate will resume consideration of S1813, which the clerk will report. Calendar number 311, S1813, a bill to reauthorize federal aid highway and highway safety construction programs and for other purposes.
Mr. President. The Assistant Republican Leader is recognized. Mr. President, uh, I ask unanimous consent to speak in morning business uh, for, as if in morning business, for 10 minutes, and that I be followed by the Senator from Texas, Senator Alexander. From Tennessee. What did I say? Oh. <laughs> Mr. President. Without objection. From, from Tennessee. So we, 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 wherever I said, I apologize. <laughs> The senator from Tennessee. I said Texas. I have not objection. So ordered. I really apologize in that event. <laughs> Mr. President, uh, I, I need to speak for a few minutes this morning about two important news events of this week: the budget that was submitted by the president, and the news reports that the president is considering reducing our nuclear arsenal to dramatically lower levels than they are today. So let me speak to both of those subjects briefly this morning, and then I'll have more to say about them as time goes on here. In the President's budget, there's a specific part for uh, the Department of Energy that funds the nuclear weapon program. And despite promises of the President that he would follow what's called the 1251 study, and uh, over the, uh, the course of his presidency request the, in the budget the sums of money for the uh, uh, department is called the NNSA, part of the Department of Energy. Uh, he reduced that this year by um, $372 million, less than the target, and the net result of that over five years is going to be $4.3 billion. And I know my colleague from Tennessee is very interested in this. Before the START Treaty was uh, debated, there was a big debate about whether or not the funding for the NNSA and the Nuclear Modernization Program was adequate. On the Veterans Day recess, before we began the debate on START, uh, General Chilton, former head of STRATCOM, and Dr. Miller, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense, um, flew to Phoenix and uh, said to me, you were right, we were wrong, we've underfunded this by over $4 billion, we're going to add that to our five-year budget profile. Uh, this was the argument that we had been making all along. You've underfunded the nuclear modernization program. You need to add between four and five billion dollars to it. They agreed. That went into what was called the revised 1251 report. As a result of the budget request this year, we're right back to where we started from before the revisions. Four point three billion dollars below. And that's where we were when the administration came forward and said, you're right, we were wrong, our previous figure wasn't enough. So we've got a problem, and it's going to cause some real disruptions. One of the things we have to do is extend the life of one of our old weapons called the B-61. This is a two-year delay now in that, a two-year delay in another uh, warhead called the W-76, at least a five-year delay in the construction of the plutonium processing facility at Los Alamos Laboratory called the CMRR facility. Now. Why is that important? We knew prior to the commitments the President made before the START Treaty was debated that the CMRR was critical. We don't have a production capacity. Unlike Russia and China, for example, we can't produce new nuclear weapons. We have to go back and revise the ones we have. And one of the facilities that would enable us to do that is this CMRR facility. In fact, that's where a great deal of the work would, would be done. And what we were told was uh, that the president was fully committed to constructing this facility on the timetable set out in the 1251 report. Some of us were a little dubious. The president's representative said, we'll put it to you in writing. And so he did. And what he said in his message on the New START Treaty to the Senate with regard to this facility, and I'll, I'll quote it, uh, it, it, the letter related to his intent to modernize and replace the, uh, the triad. And he said, quote, to accelerate to the extent possible the design engineering phase of the chemistry and metallurgy research replacement, or CMRR building, and the uranium processing facility, or UPF, that's the facility for uranium processing at Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And, I'm again quoting, to request full funding, including on a multi-year basis, as appropriate for the CMRR building and the UPF upon completion of design and engineering phase. We were concerned that he wouldn't request the funding in the out years and that they wouldn't accelerate the construction of these facilities. So he said he would. He would accelerate it to the extent possible and request full funding including on a multi-year basis. The budget he submitted this year 
breaks that commitment to the United States Senate. And those senators who voted for the treaty based upon these commitments are obviously going to be re-evaluating their support for the treaty. And there's things that can be done by the Congress, including our power of the purse, to deal with the issue, which I'll hope to have time to speak to in a moment. Former Secretary Gates reflected the Senate's reliance on these commitments when he said, and he, he, this is a quotation, this modernization program was very carefully worked out between ourselves and the Department of Energy, and frankly, where we came out on that played a fairly significant role in the willingness of the Senate to ratify the New START agreement. So for those who relied on the administration's commitment, they've been broken. We're right back to where we started from before the treaty was taken up. And if you want to know specifically what the problems are, uh, Dr. Charles McMillan, the Los Alamos director, said, and I'm quoting, without CMRR, there is no identified path to meet the nation's requirement of 50 to 80 pits per year. The budget reductions in fiscal 13 compounds an already difficult set of FY12 budget challenges and raises questions about whether we can meet the pace of the modernization path outlined in the 2010 nuclear posture review. So, Mr. President, we've got a problem. And unless the President is willing to work with members of Congress, and unless members of Congress are willing to recognize that uh, the Senate acted based upon some commitments the administration made, and we have to keep our end of the bargain as well, we're going to find a huge problem with our modernization program, with our nuclear weapon program, uh, and all of that portends with respect to our deterrent capability. Now let me turn to the other news of the week. The President's people confirmed that, yes, they are in fact studying whether or not we can reduce our nuclear warheads. Remember, we were at 1,500 for uh, start, and uh, an 80 percent reduction could take us down to 300. Now, that is almost unthinkable, uh, especially in today's environment where you have Russia and China with new production capacities. They are developing new nuclear weapons and producing them. We are not designing or developing any new nuclear weapons. We have no plans to do so, and we have no production capacity to make them, even if we did. And the production or the capacity to refurbish the old ones is now going to be delayed another five years. So why would we be thinking about reducing our warheads even further under these circumstances? Well, some people say with a really robust nuclear, uh, excuse me, missile defense program, and uh, by upgrading our conventional capabilities, we might think about this. The problem with those two assumptions is this budget cuts both of them dramatically as well. We're not enhancing conventional capabilities, we're drawing them down. Which, by the way, is what has caused the Russians to rely much more heavily on their nuclear program. What about the uh, people who rely on our nuclear deterrence, the 32 countries that rely on our nuclear umbrella? If they see this, my guess is they're going to look at what they might do to develop their own weapons. So much for non-proliferation. What about the idea that countries that now have close to 300 weapons uh, could become peers of the United States? How is that for strategy? To have Pakistan, which will have soon more weapons than Britain does, uh, to have as many weapons, nuclear weapons, as the United States. That's not exactly the most stable place in the world today. Iran is developing its capability. North Korea already has it. The Chinese are already at roughly this level and improving their capability. And of course, Russia is much above it and uh, talking about actually building more nuclear weapons, not fewer. Um, you know, just to mention one other point here, uh, let, let me just close. The defense, uh, Deputy Defense Minister in Russia recently said I do, on February 6th, I do not rule out that under certain circumstances we will have to boost not cut our nuclear arsenal. And now we're talking about reducing ours. How are we going to convince the Russians to, uh, to reduce their? I presume this is all going to be done in some kind of additional treaty with the, uh, with the Russians. Not likely to occur. But to me, one of the most bothersome things here is that one of the arguments that nuclear opponents has, have always had is that uh, we never want to get to a point where our doctrine, instead of holding hostage the military capability of any would-be adversary, would be to hold civilians hostage, innocent civilians. And that's precisely what happens when instead of having enough nuclear weapons to cover all of the targets, the military targets of a potential adversary, you end up having only enough weapons to hold at hostage the cities 
of your potential adversary and thus the civilian population of those countries. That is not a moral deterrent. And as a result, I think we have to think very carefully about this prospect of reducing our, our nuclear weaponry. We obviously have to do a lot more work on uh, this issue in the Congress. As I said, we have some means of, of um, uh, expressing our views to the administration. I think it needs to think very carefully about this. To the extent that it thinks it's going to solve uh, or going to help with, uh, with our financial crisis, reducing the number of warheads, unfortunately, doesn't reduce a lot of expense. It's a little bit like the BRAC Commission. So that cannot be cited as a reason to do this. And finally, nor is there any prospect that we can serve as a moral example to other countries in the world by reducing our warheads to that level. Uh, the START Treaty was supposed to be a, a new reset showing the world through our moral example the benefits of reducing uh, warheads. And uh, not a country in the world has reduced warheads since the signing of the new START Treaty, except the United States. Russia hasn't, China hasn't, Pakistan hasn't, our allies have not, and Iran and North Korea talk about expanding their programs. So this is based on a very shaky proposition of benefits which are very unlikely to occur and it is fraught with dangers um, that uh, we must debate in this country without having, before the president simply unilaterally decides to make such a drastic change in American policy. We'll have uh, more time to discuss this in the future, but Mr. President, given the fact that these two events were really kicked off this week, the president's budget and this latest announcement, I thought we should at least have a preliminary discussion of it on the floor of the Senate today. I yield to my colleague from Tennessee. Uh, Mr. President. The senior senator from Tennessee is recognized. Mr. President, I'd like to talk as a good morning business. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, I'm here to talk about another subject, marketplace fairness. But before I do, I want to acknowledge the importance of what the senator from Arizona has had to say and his leadership, especially, uh, well, in the whole area of our nuclear doctrine, but especially in the area of nuclear weapons modernization. I think he's correct to say that the uh, discussion about Section 1251, which he described, which is the goal for uh, uh, the amount of money we need to modernize our nuclear weapons that we have in this country, may not have been the reason that the New START Treaty passed. But I doubt the New START Treaty would have been ratified without it. So it is an important part of that debate, and it's an important part of the debate today. And I'm, I'm one of those senators who's right in the middle of the discussion. I worked with the senator from Arizona in the last appropriations bill when he worked harder than anyone, really, to try to, to get the amount of appropriations closer to the 1251 number. We made some progress, but still fell short. And this represents a substantial challenge to us. So I think he's put his finger on a very important problem. Uh, and when we talk about reducing defense spending, this is the kind of thing that, or sequestering defense spending, this is the kind of thing that we end up uh, having to deal with. Because e even in the last year, both the administration and the Senate Appropriations Committee moved some money from defense over to this account to try to increase uh, the, the money for nuclear weapons modernization. And still, there wasn't enough to meet the 1251 commitment that many of us agreed to at the time the New START Treaty was enacted. So I thank him for his comments. I look forward to working with him uh, on, on that important question. Mr. President, I, I'd like to talk about marketplace fairness, which ought to be an all-American subject here in the Senate. And it's turned out to be one that attracts strong bipartisan support. In November, Senator Enzi of Wyoming uh, the Democratic whip, Senator Durbin, and I introduced, along with seven other senators, an equal number from both sides of the aisle, what we call the Marketplace Fairness Act to close a 20-year loophole that distorts the American marketplace by picking winners and losers, by subsidizing some businesses at the expense of other businesses, and sub subsidizing some taxpayers at the expense of other taxpayers. My colleagues and I keep talking about it because we strongly believe, as do many people across this country, that now is the time for Congress to act. 
Many Americans don't realize that when they buy something online, which we increasingly do today, or order something through a catalog, which we've done for a long time, from a business outside of our own state, in the case of the catalog, that we still owe the state sales tax. So what we're talking about doesn't even rise to the dignity of a loophole. What we're talking about is a law that says you owe the state sales tax even if you buy it online and even if you buy it from a catalog from out of state. The law says today already if you buy it, you owe it. This is not a problem only for big retailers like Amazon and Walmart. It's a problem that's killing small businesses in Tennessee and across our country. Last month, Governor Bill Haslam of Tennessee and I spoke with small business owners from Knoxville and Oak Ridge, Chattanooga, Johnson City, Nashville, and Memphis about this problem. Every single one of those business owners shared personal stories about how this loophole has hurt their business. Basically, this is what they say happens. I remember the story of the Nashville Boot Company. I talked with the owner there. A customer comes into the store, tries on a boot, gets advice from employees about the boot, and then goes home to buy the product online in order to avoid paying the state sales tax, which the customer owes. The state law says you owe the tax. The problem is when you buy something at the Nashville Boot Company or any other local store, the Nashville Boot Company collects the tax from you, adds it to your bill, and then sends the money to the state. That's how it's always worked. But if you buy the same boot or the same other article online or through a catalog, that business doesn't collect the state sales tax, even though you owe it. So the result is that similar businesses selling the same thing are being treated entirely differently. That isn't right, and it isn't fair, and most Americans who have looked at the issue agree with that. So how did this happen? Well, in 1992, when most of us couldn't possibly have imagined how the Internet would have changed the way we shop for things, the Supreme Court said states couldn't require out-of-state catalogs or online sellers to do the same thing states require of stores up and down Main Street. What was the reason? Because it was too complicated for an online seller like Amazon or, or a catalog seller to figure out what could the sales tax be in Tennessee and then how much do you have to add on in Maryville, which is a town I live in. Well, 20 years ago, I might have agreed with that. But today, technology has made it easy for catalog sellers or online sellers to do the same thing Main Street sellers are required to do. Let me give you an example. This morning, I wanted to know what the weather was in my hometown of Maryville, Tennessee. So I opened my computer up, I went to Google, I typed in my zip code, I typed in weather, and it told me the weather. The software now exists to provide to catalog sellers or online sellers the same sort of easy way to find out what the sales tax is if I were to buy a TV set online in Maryville, Tennessee, they could just type in that city, the price, my name, and it would tell them tax. They could even send the tax on to the state. In fact, it's about as easy with this software that's under our law going to have to be provided to anybody from out of state. It's about as easy for them to find out what the tax is as it would be for the Nashville Boot Company when somebody walks in and tries on the boots in Nashville. Some people have asked, well, why should Congress get involved in this? Because nothing is preventing states from going ahead and collecting those taxes. That's true. If I were to buy my boots in Nashville and uh, online and not pay the sales tax, uh, the governor could come knocking on my door and <clears throat> add on the nine cents or whatever it is, nine percent, onto the purchase price of the boots. But that's not going to happen in a practical world. I mean, the state can't, can't do that for, for millions of purchases that are made every year online, and no one wants the governor and his agents knocking on our doors about that. So there's a simpler way to do it. And Congress should make it easy for states to be able to do that because we should recognize the loophole is unfair, that it's anti-competitive, and it's distorting the marketplace. As a Republican, 
as a Republican senator. I believe our party should oppose government policies that prefer some businesses over other businesses and some taxpayers over other taxpayers. And I believe in states' rights. Our bill gives states the right to make decisions for themselves. If Illinois or Tennessee or California wants to prefer some businesses over others, wants to prefer some taxpayers over others, they can do that. That's their state's right. But we ought to make it possible for them not to do that. A number of conservatives have been outspoken supporters for our legislation. At times, conservatives were reluctant to support it over the years because it was complicated and because it, quote, sounded like a, quote, tax. Well, it's about a tax, but it's a tax that's already owed. Here's what Al Cardenas, the head of the chairman of the American Conservative Union, says. He supports our legislation, and he says, quote, there's no more glaring example of misguided government power than when taxes or regulations affect two similar businesses completely differently, unquote. Governor Haley Barber also supports our bill. He said, there's, no simply, there's simply no longer a compelling reason for government to continue giving online retailers special treatment over small businesses. Governor Mitch Daniels of Indiana said a similar thing. Congressman Mike Pence of Indiana, a well-known conservative congressman, said, quote, I don't think Congress should be in the business of picking winners and losers. Inaction by Congress today results in a system that does pick winners and losers. That's what Mike Pence had to say. At CPAC this past weekend, a gathering of conservative activists, there was a panel of leaders and industry experts about this legislation. And the general agreement was that Congress should act to solve the problem. The solution, the panelists said, should be fair, something people can understand, and meet the needs of states, consumers, and retailers. I believe our legislation accomplishes all these goals. In the first place, it's a rarity in federal legislation. It is only 10 pages long. You can actually read it in a few minutes. It's fair because it gives states the right to decide for themselves how to enforce the state's own laws. It protects businesses and consumers by requiring states to adopt business simple basic simplifications. I, th that I'm talking about the software that you could give to Amazon so it could figure out in an instant what the tax on my TV set is if I buy a TV set online from Amazon. And it exempts small businesses that sell for less than 500000 a year in remote sales uh, uh, each year. That's very important. I use the example of the Nashville Boot Company. He sells online, and he sells out the front door. He said never in his history has he sold more than $400,000 worth of revenue, uh, of revenue from his boot sales online. And when he began, he at least was one of the larger sellers of boots online. So the $500,000 exemption for small businesses from this legislation should go a long way to meet the concerns of those senators on both sides who want to make sure we don't impose some sort of new rule on very small entrepreneurs. Another reason Congress should act now is that states and local governments will lose an estimated $23 billion in collected sales tax revenue in 2012 just because of this loophole. Here's what former Governor Jeb Bush had to say about that. Quote, it seems to me there has to be a way to tax sales done online in the same way that sales are taxed in brick and mortar establishment. My guess is that there would be hundreds of millions of dollars that could then be used to reduce taxes to fill campaign promises. Uncollected sales taxes could be used to pay for things our states need to pay for now. They could be used to reduce college tuition. They could be used to pay outstanding teachers. But they also could be used to reduce the sales tax rate or to reduce some other tax or to avoid a tax altogether. In Tennessee, where we don't have a state income tax, we'd like to avoid one. State income tax are probably the worst words in our vocabulary. And collecting tax on sales from everybody that owes us could 
not only reduce our sales tax, but help us avoid a state income tax. Governor Haslam of Tennessee, who strongly supports our legislation, said it's just too big a piece of our economy now to treat it like we did 20 years ago. Governor Haslam is right. Online sales set new records last year, and while the growth of e-commerce is very good news for our economy, our local businesses are getting hurt because they're not competing on a level playing field. That's why our legislation has the support of the National Governors Association, the National Conference of State Legislatures, the Conference of Mayors, the National Association of Counties, just to name a few. About the only ones left who are complaining about our legislation are taxpayers and businesses who are being subsidized by other taxpayers and businesses because the playing field isn't level. Amazon, a huge online seller, strongly supports our legislation. Over the years, they've opposed legislation like this. Now they believe we've solved the problem. Why? Because they say our bill makes it easy for consumers and easy for retailers to comply with state sales tax laws, and it helps states without raising taxes or new federal spending. Some people will tell you we're talking about taxing the Internet. That's not true. Our legislation doesn't create a new tax. It doesn't tax the Internet. The Senate debated Internet access taxes several years ago. I was in the middle of the debate. It led to a moratorium on Internet access taxes. That moratorium is still in effect today. So we're talking about a tax or taxes that already are the law, and we're talking about an Internet sales tax, a, 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 a Internet access moratorium tax which will stay in place and not be altered. It's very hard to see how anyone can say with a straight face that giving states the right to collect taxes that are already owed is a tax increase. I spent a lot of time talking with my colleagues about making the Senate work more effectively. One way to do that is to make sure that senators have the opportunity to thoroughly consider important legislation. On January 31st, just a few weeks ago, over 200 businesses, state and national trade associations, sent a letter to the senator from Montana, the chairman of the Finance Committee, asking him to co-sponsor our bill to address the inequity this year. Senator, senator Enzi and the bill's co-sponsors have also urged senator, the Senate Finance Committee to hold a hearing on our bill as soon as possible. The House Judiciary Committee's already held a hearing. They did it on, on November 30th. It gave House members of both political parties the opportunity to learn more about the issue and express their support for it. And I hope that the Senate Finance Committee will seriously consider our request and soon find time so that senators can have the same opportunity that House members have had. Ten years ago, the bills that we considered to try to close this loophole and fix this problem simply weren't adequate to solve the problem. The legislation that we introduced in November does solve the problem. It is simple, it's about state rights, it's about fairness, and it solves the problem. It doesn't cost the federal government a dime, it doesn't change federal tax laws, it doesn't change state tax laws, it doesn't require states to do anything, it simply gives states the right to decide for themselves how to enforce their own laws. This is a 20-year-old law that only the federal government can solve. Unless we act, states will continue to be deprived of their right to enforce their own tax laws, and businesses will not be allowed to compete on a level playing field. Mr. President, I'd ask consent to include following my remarks a letter uh, to Chairman Baucus and Ranking Member Hatch from the 10 Senate bipartisan co-sponsors of this legislation of January 31 asking for a hearing on the Marketplace Fairness Act, a memo outlining quotes from conservative voices on e-fairness, and another memo entitled Support for the Marketplace Fairness Act at the Conservative Political Action Conference. Sir, objection. It's ordered. I thank the President, and I yield the floor, and I notice the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
Well, the Senate gaveled in this morning at 10 Eastern for morning business. They have been in morning business and uh, at times have touched on the uh, $109 billion surface transportation bill. That is likely to be the main agenda item along with the uh, general speeches for the rest of the day. By the way, The Hill reported yesterday that the transportation bill has hit a snag. California Senator Boxer says the measure has been held up by ridiculously unrelated amendments and she sees no path forward. The bill doesn't include provisions to expand oil drilling, but it has been bogged down by amendments such as a measure dealing with foreign aid to Egypt and an effort to include contraception in their health care plans. The House, by the way, is in recess until noon for one-minute speeches, and then they'll be back into recess until 3 this afternoon. At that time, they'll continue debating amendments to the oil shale leasing a measure related to the surface transportation bill. There are at least eight amendments to that bill and offshore oil and gas drilling legislation. Boats are expected at about 4.30 this afternoon in the House. You can see the House live on C-SPAN, the Senate here, of course, on C-SPAN 2.
California is recognized. I ask the quorum call be dispensed. Without objection, so ordered. Mr. President, we have on the floor of the United States Senate the transportation bill. And uh, you might wonder why a bill that is the number one jobs bill that we can do here uh, is moving so slowly. You might wonder, any normal person would wonder, why a bill that is so popular that it has everyone from the AFL-CIO to the Chamber of Commerce supporting it is moving so slowly. You might wonder why it's moving so slowly since the transportation authorization for all of our highway and transit projects expires in about a month. You might wonder why it's moving so slowly. Why isn't anyone here? What is going on? And yesterday I came here and said uh, I didn't see a clear path forward for this bill. And it's very disturbing. And, and I'll tell you why it's so disturbing. And that is when you look at the construction area of our economy, it is still down. We have, is it 1.5 million unemployed construction workers? And if you think of in your mind's eye what that is, I have a picture here of a, uh, of a stadium during the Super Bowl. And Mr. President, you can see this stadium. Uh, and I want you to picture everyone sitting in this stadium is an unemployed construction worker and think about 15 stadiums full. Yesterday I said it was 10. That was incorrect. I stand corrected today. 15 stadiums full of unemployed construction workers just praying that we pass this bill because they are unemployed and this bill will create up to 2.8 million jobs. It will save 1.8 Eight and create up to a million. So it will make a huge dent on employment in the construction sector. Well, yesterday I said I didn't see a clear path forward. Today I see a path forward. I really do. There's been some progress overnight, but it isn't as clear as it should be. We asked both sides of the aisle, we said, can you come up with amendments that you feel compelled to offer to this bill? and try to keep them related to transportation. Well, the bad news is there's a lot of extraneous amendments that were filed. First and foremost, birth control. Birth control. The Blunt Amendment, not only does it say that any employer could say they have a moral objection, it doesn't even have to be religious objection, any employer so if I'm an employer and I employ 100 people and let's say I believe in prayer over medicine and I can then deny health care to all my employees. This makes no sense at all. And Senator Blunt says, well, you could take it to court. Oh, sure. Some low-paid employee is going to take it to court. So we have to deal with this birth control amendment and health care amendment on a highway bill. As I said yesterday, at first when I saw a birth control amendment, I thought maybe it says you can't take your birth control pills when you're on a federal highway. What is going on here? There's no relation. It's bizarre to offer these unrelated amendments. Then we have an amendment on Egypt. Now, Frankly, I'm ready to vote on the birth control amendment. I'm happy to vote on an Egypt amendment, although I believe, this is my own view as a member of the Foreign Relations Committee, that when we have such delicate negotiations going on over the safety of our citizens who are being held there, we have to be very careful not to uh, interfere in that important backdoor diplomacy that's going on. But we have one senator that is holding up everything because he insists that we have to make, take a stand on Egypt even though we have Americans in danger over there. My Republican friends really have to understand what's at stake here. The business community, the labor community, everyone 
is in favor of this transportation bill. And we're going to have to face votes that are unrelated. There's an idea to repeal a very important environmental regulation that will clean up the pollution from boilers. Pollution that is dangerous. It's mercury. It causes brain damage. It's arsenic. It's lead. And as I said yesterday, and Mr. President, I don't know whether you've had this experience. I have never, in the history of my electoral career, which spans a, lo a long time, have anyone come up to me and say, please, please, Barbara, we really need more arsenic in our air. We need arsenic in our water. We need more lead. We need more mercury. People don't want it. Why on earth would they now come forward in a highway bill and repeal a very important rule that will make our families healthier? That's what my Republican friends are putting out there. They want to drill off our coast, even though it might interfere with the fishing industry, the tourist industry, the recreation industry. I, I just would urge my colleagues, in a hand of friendship, we are happy to look at transportation-related amendments. We can work those through. My staff and Senator Inhofe's staff are very, uh, have a very close working relationship. And we can take these relevant amendments and sit down and work through them. But obviously, if there are going to be a series of amendments on birth control and foreign policy matters and extraneous matters, it makes it very, very difficult. It diverts our attention from what's at stake. We, the clock is ticking on us. This transportation authorization that we uh, have expires in March. So here's where we are. We're going to have a cloture vote on the various titles to the bill. The finance title, the banking title, the Commerce Committee title. And I want to praise all of the committees. They've done their work. Four committees, including ours, the EPW Environment and Public Works Committee. We have all done our work. We've done our jobs. We did what we had to do. We passed out the legislation. Now let's marry all the pieces and get going with legitimate amendments and get this done. Get this done. And um, so I urge colleagues to vote yes on cloture. I know some have problems with one of the titles. And it, we can amend that. If you don't like something in that title, we can amend it. And if we don't make cloture on the first round, we will come up with a path forward after that. But please, it won't work if we have all of these bizarre extraneous amendments. I'm not saying the amendments are bizarre. Some are. But they're extraneous. And they don't belong on this bill. Now, I want to take a minute to remind my colleagues how popular the transportation authorization is. President Reagan, do we have that ad? Uh, we're going to show you the ad that's being run. But President Reagan was very clear on why it was so important to uh, pass a transportation bill. Here's what he said. The state of our transportation system affects our commerce, our economy, and our future. He said, clearly, this program is an investment in tomorrow that we must make today. And um, there is a, a, a very good coalition out there, broad coalition, taking ads on the radio. and. After they quote Ronald Reagan, they say, it's time for leadership again, for new investments in transportation, to keep America moving and jobs growing. Call Congress, tell them to pass the highway and transit bill, and once again make transportation job number one. So this is out on, on the radio airwaves. I'm, I'm very grateful that it's happening. I really, really am. And also we have ads in the various uh, newspapers. Then there's another one that marries up uh, two president's statements, uh, President Reagan and President Clinton. They quote uh, President Clinton by saying, 
by modernizing and building roads, bridges, transportation, and railroads, we, usher, we can usher in two decades of unparalleled growth. And then they also quote Ronald Reagan again. He says, a network of highways and mass transit has enabled our commerce to thrive. And, the, and at the end it says, tell Congress to pass the highway and transit bill and make transportation job number one. So here we sit, and, and I wanted to show you, I don't know if people could see this, I, I hope you can see this, uh, Mr. President. This is an ad that is running all over today. President Reagan stood up for public transportation, will you? And then they quote him, and then they say, a recovering economy is exactly the time to rebuild America. President Reagan knew it in 1983 when he signed the law dedicating motor fuel revenues to public transportation for years to come. But now the House, and they talk about the problem with the House bill, and they tell the House to fix their proposal, which we hope that they are doing as we speak. So this is a, a very important endeavor. Um, you know, again, I've been around a long time, Mr. President, I have never seen a coalition, the likes of the coalition we have seen. Can you show the chart that shows over the thousand organizations? Um, we have a coalition, Mr. President, is the broadest coalition I have ever seen in my life in every single state, whether it's Ohio or California or New York or Alabama or Nevada or Kentucky. I am telling you, this is a strong coalition. Um, and this is what they wrote to us. In 2011, political leaders, Republican and Democrat, House, Senate, and the administration, stated a multi-year surface transportation bill is important for job creation and economic recovery. We urge you to follow words with action. Make transportation job number one and move immediately in the House and the Senate to invest in the roads and the bridges and transit systems that are the backbone of the U.S. economy. It's business, large and small, and communities of all sizes. And that is basically uh, from the letter signed by over a thousand organizations. Do you have a list of organizations? And I see that my friend from California is here. She may be speaking on this topic or another topic, and I'm going to yield to her momentarily. Um, I, I think it's important to take a look at the organizations I talked about just to give you a sense of it. First of all, every state in the union uh, is listed on this letter uh, Mr. President, and I want to ask unanimous consent to place in the record um, this, uh, this letter and the list of organizations listed by state. Not objection, so. Thank you. And I'm going to name a few of them. The American Composite Manufacturers Association, the American Concrete Pavement Association, the American Hotel and Lodging Association, the American Nursery and Landscape Association, the American Society of Civil Engineers, the Associated General Contractors of America, the National Society of Professional Engineers, the National Resources Defense Council, the North American Die Casting Association, the Pacific Northwest Waterways Association, the Reconnecting America, the Retail Industry Leaders Association, the Transportation for America, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Travel Association, the United Brotherhood of Carpenters and Joiners, the Laborers International, the International Bridge Tunnel and Turnpike Association. It goes on and on, a thousand groups representing Democrats, Republicans, Independents. I am so grateful to them and I speak with them, frankly, a couple of times a week to tell them what we are doing here to move forward this important bill. And I told them yesterday that they needed to contact every single senator in this chamber to let them know what is at stake in their states. In closing, I will say this. Madam President, sometimes when we act, we not only do something good, which this bill will do, 
It's a reform bill. It's a great bill. And it adds to the TIFIA program an idea that came out of Los Angeles and is going to create up to a million new jobs while protecting 1.8 million jobs. So we do good things. But we also, Madam President, when we do this, we stop bad things from happening. What will happen if we fail to act by March 30th and there is no action to fill that trust fund, which our bill does? 600,000 jobs will be lost. And later today, at a time when others are not here, I will go state by state. Here it is. Estimated jobs lost. There would be a 35% cut in transportation funding if we don't pass this bill and the finance title that raises the funds necessary. And we will break this down. And let me tell you, it's an ugly picture for us to have to go home and face the music at home and tell construction workers that even though we have 1.5 million unemployed construction workers, that's going to go up by 600,000 jobs. We cannot afford to let this bill stop. I will not let this bill go away. I will assert every right I have as a U.S. Senator from California where we have 63,000 of these jobs at stake. And I'm going to be here on the floor and we're going to get this bill done one way or another. And we stand ready to work with our colleagues, to work with our Republican friends, to go through these amendments that are relevant and urge them to backtrack on these very unrelated uh, amendments. And I thank you so much, and I would yield the floor. The Senator from California. Madam President, I want to thank my friend and colleague, the distinguished chairman of the committee, for her work in managing this bill. This is a huge bill. It's got many titles. It's a complex bill. It is a totally vital bill. And both on this floor and off this floor, she has been advocating and pushing and doing what's necessary. I just want to say thank you very, very much, yes, my friend and colleague, Senator Boxer. Thank you, and we'll work on that. Thank you. Let me describe what happened in 2008 in Chatsworth, California. On September 12, 2008, Metrolink commuter train carrying 111 more, uh, train 111, carrying more than 200 people, departed the Chatworth train station about 4.20 p.m. Heading west, the commuter train ran through a train signal at 44 miles per hour at 4.22 and 2 seconds. The train signal showed red for stop. At the same time, a Union Pacific freight train, weighing four times the weight of the commuter train, was heading east on the same track. It exited a tunnel with little time to react to the oncoming com computer train. Both trains were on the same track going in opposite directions, each going roughly 40 miles per hour. The trains collided head on. The carnage was unspeakable. 25 people died. Their bodies, many torn to pieces, had to be extracted from heaps of steel and wreckage. This is the scene. This is the commuter train. This is the freight train. This is the car that essentially chopped apart 25 people. As Superior Judge Peter Lichtman wrote, there were teachers, federal, state, municipal employees, business owners, executives, artists, and students that were all lost on that day. Many families were left without any provider, not to mention the loss of a mother or father. Another 101 people were injured, many of them very seriously. Volunteers and rescue crews worked valiantly to pull them from the wreckage. You can see this overturned train here. You see the rescue crews. Um, it was just, it was a terrible, terrible scene. Judge Peter Lichtman described many of these injuries. Passengers seated at table seats suffered horrible abdominal injuries 
that could not be medically resolved. All of the bench passengers were launched head or face first into a bulkhead. Almost all of these passengers suffered traumatic brain injuries to varying degrees. Let me explain how and why this happened. Seconds before the crash, the train's engineer was text messaging on his cell phone. He was the only person, only personnel aboard that train. When he looked down to send a text to a teenage boy, this was one of 21 text messages sent by this engineer this day. He received 20 text messages and made four outgoing telephone calls, all while he was driving a large commuter train. According to the NTSB comprehensive report on the crash, this behavior distracted the engineer and caused the collision. It led to the train running red signals. In fact, NTSB found the passenger train's engineer never even hit the brakes before impact. NTSB found that a crash avoidance system would have stopped the train and prevented this disaster. But unfortunately, the tracks in Los Angeles had and have no such systems, nor do most tracks in the United States. As a result of this accident, 25 people died and 100 people were injured. The statistics about the Chatworth disaster do not begin to tell the story. Perhaps I might be able to better put into words what's at stake in this debate in one of the votes we will be taking about positive train control by telling you a little bit about Carrie Shea and Otto Vias. 18-year-old Carrie didn't want to trouble her father to drive her from her family's Newhall home to the restaurant in Simi Valley, so she took the train. In October 2008, she became one of many young people killed in this crash. She was just starting her senior year at Hart High School and looking forward to a career in medicine, according to her family. She played tennis for the school and was well liked by her classmates who described her as warm and caring. Anyone who knew her can remember her by her beaming smile and infectious laughs, one of her classmates told the Long Los Angeles Times. And here she is. She had such a positive outlook on life and always had something nice to say about everyone, wrote a parent of a varsity tennis player. I feel blessed to have been part of her life. And then there is Alto Vias here, a student at Claremont McKenna College who was studying to become a doctor. At 20 years old, he was in the process of applying to graduate programs at MIT, Duke, and Harvard. He scored in the top 1% of his medical school entry exams, but he was having trouble answering one question on applications. Describe a hardship you've overcome. He said, I've not had any. I've had a blessed life, explained his father. Atul never finished that application, nor did he reach his goal of medical school. He took Metrolink train 111 home to visit his family, as he did every two to three weeks. But he never made it home because an engineer was texting. As the NTSB found, these young lives and the lives of 23 others could have been saved if crash avoidance technology, known as positive train control, had been in place. In 2008, Congress finally required railroads to deploy positive train control, which the National Transportation Safety Board had placed on its top 10 most wanted safety technologies listed since 1990. This body gave, this body gave the railroad industry seven years to deploy positive train control crash avoidance systems nationwide. The leaders of Southern California Met Metrolink, Union Pacific, 
and BNSF railroads each committed to deploy positive train control systems in Los Angeles years earlier than the national mandate. These railroads are still on track to deploy the system next year. I met yesterday with John Fenton, the new CEO of Metrolink, and Matt Chase, the CEO of BNSF. They both indicated their desire to make the highest priority positive train control. And I really thank them. Uh, the Metrolink's going to go ahead with it as soon as possible, regardless. BNSF told us, well, if they delay, if this bill delays it, they may take an additional year. Um, I really salute both of them for their support of this program. However, I'm very alarmed that others in the railroad industry and in Congress diminish the value of positive train control. As a matter of fact, the bill that we will most likely be voting on as one of its titles, the Commerce title, delays positive train control until 2015. And the House bill delays it until 2020. That's, uh, when the technology, technology is there, despite its complications of installation, when you have high risk lines, freight lines and commuter lines traveling in opposite directions on the same track, and when you have human frailty, in this case, one engineer aboard a commuter train of a couple of hundred people texting, the only answer to assure the safety to the commuter trains of this nation really, in my view, is positive train control. I view it as an emergency need. The NTSB views it as an emergency need. According to them, scores of deadly accidents across the country since 1970 could have been prevented if positive train control in effect were installed. And I agree strongly with the NTSB Chairman Deborah Herzman, who I happen to know, who recently wrote to the Congress this, the NTSB will be disappointed if installation of this vital safety system to prevent fatalities and injuries is delayed, end quote. The need to extend the 2015 positive train control deployment deadline has not been demonstrated. The Senate Commerce Committee has held no hearings on this issue. No published reports investigating this question have recommended an extension, according to the NTSB experts. Furthermore, every railroad has submitted an approved plan to meet the 2015 deadline to the Federal Railroad Administration. And the administration is preparing a report to Congress on positive train control deployment progress this year, which should provide us guidance on that effort to date. I think Congress should consider the FRA's findings carefully before scaling back or delaying a system that can prevent crashes like Chatsworth. And there have been three prior crashes that have taken lives on this Metro's link system. These are not isolated things. They happen. And we now have a technical system that can be 100% proof positive to provide safety. So I'm very concerned that without a national strategy, deployment of positive train control in Southern California will become more difficult. There will be excuses. There will be a lessening of effort. And both BNSF and Metrolink have made very strong efforts to comply with 2015. Why change it? The Los Angeles area is a huge commuter area. And when it's not necessary to change it, why do it? 
The national requirement to deploy this system by 2015 creates a substantial incentive for industry to develop new and cost-effective technology that lowers the deployment cost for everyone, including Metrolink. A national strategy, which will hopefully be presented in the FRA's 2012 report to Congress, could play a significant role in addressing positive train control deployment barriers. This system can prevent human errors from causing collisions, dangerous releases of hazard materials, and passengers and train crews from being killed and injured. So I make these remarks today in the hopes that there will be support in this body for the 2015 deadline. And I really appeal to the committee that right now is locked in at 2018. We have tried, we have talked to the staff, we have been rejected to understand that what they are delaying is a device that saves lives. And there is no excuse for so doing. The case has not been made to do so. The hearings have not taken place. There was no markup to add this. And I strongly believe it should not be delayed in this bill. I hope members will listen. I hope they will respond. You know, hundreds of thousands of commuters are at risk until this, sent, this system is put into place. I thank